The following podcast may contain adult language and an abundance of salt. So get ready to call Judah Dame because we're talking Frank Miller movies. I cried at the end of 300 this week. It got me, man. What are we doing first? <laughs> what are we doing first? Hey, welcome everybody. Thanks for listening to the Salty Nerd Podcast. I'm your host, the Salty Nerd. And today's episode, we're going to be talking about Frank Miller comic book adaptation movies. 300, Sin City, and The Spirit. And I am joined, as always, by my illustrious co-hosts and the now-deemed god of salt and thunder, Matt Vader, 70 Thor. Salt and thunder. That's right. <laughs> What's up, bro? Man, Frank Miller is a crazy motherfucker. Dude. I love yeah. him. I love him. <clears throat> he's crazy and he's awesome. I feel like I'm going to be really sweary this week. Uh-oh. Well, I can't do anything about that. That's okay. You know, I, I feel like it's okay, though, because if, if I was looking at stuff on... YouTube this week and Matt has like after every video he's like has this really long disclaimer, disclaimer. and it's like it's like this video might have adult words in it if you're <laughs> offended go fuck yourself you know so um yeah I like it oh great that's solid advice V hi mom <laughs> Hey, doing? Alex's mom. Hey, I'm also joined by Jude, the ambassador of estrogen. <laughs> Hi. And fiery redhead dame herself. I do love my red lipstick. That's awesome. Oh, red lipstick. <laughs> Last but not least, editor and producer of the show, Matthew Kadish. <laughs> Are you going to have fun this week or what, buddy? No. <laughs> <laughs> this is all torture. 100%. You're not a Frank Miller fan? Oh, no. I, I love Frank Miller. I'm talking about dealing with you guys. <laughs> we, we've got empty what's, shot what's glasses. Wrong with us? Empty shot glasses is what's wrong with us. We're a delight. Empty shot glasses and bottle water bottles that haven't been even cracked yet. So that's great. <laughs> All right, let's get started, guys. Uh, before we do, a real quick word from our sponsors, and we'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody. All right, let's get started. Uh, we're going to start talking about the comic book adaptation, Sin City. Jude, take it away. What is this movie all about? 2005 Sin City, rated R with a runtime of two hours and four minutes, had a budget of $40 million. What do you think it brought in? $150 million. Okay, Vader? I was going to say right around there, $140. $158.7 million. Boom, man. Nice. Pretty good. Pretty yeah, good. yeah. It's got a stellar cast. This it's movie amazing. was something, man. Dude, I love this movie. All right, let me take you through the synopsis. Yeah, go for it. Sin City is infested with criminals, crooked cops, and sexy dames searching for vengeance, redemption, or both. Following several storylines, we meet Hardigan, a cop with a bum ticker and a vow to protect skinny little Nancy slash hot as hell Jessica Alba <laughs> from the yellow bastard who kidnapped her and framed Hardigan. Then we have Marv, the lovable brute, who will stop at nothing to avenge the death of Goldie, the woman he loves. Dwight, the new boyfriend of Shelly the waitress who defends Gail, the woman he'll always and never love, and her old town girls from Jackie Boy. Shelly's ex, a dirty cop who t likes talking shit and smacking broads around. <laughs> a priest who loves a boy who sings like an angel but eats people. And a hitman who gives his victims one final love story narrative before their time is up. What a freaking great movie this is. <clears throat> it's okay. Just okay? It's okay. The first time I saw this movie, I saw it in the theater with my cousin when it came out. Uh, so that was 2005? 2005, 2005. And I did not get it. My cousin and I both walked out of the theater like, why was that guy yellow? <laughs> <laughs> and every time since then that I've watched it again, I now, I now get it. Yeah. And every time since then that I've watched it, it's just better for me. Like it gets better and better every single time that I watch it. And like this time we watched it and I don't, I think it's been probably about five years since I've seen it and it ended and I was like, Oh, it's over already. But it's like over two hours long and yeah, it yeah. doesn't feel like it. No, this, this is, is one of those movies that it's just, you're just so into it as you're watching it and it ends before you want it to. Yeah. I love how it kind of, it follows the same path as like a Pulp Fiction where it's got multiple narratives that kind of intersect mm -hmm. here and there. Well, Robert Rodriguez. Yeah. And Tarantino. Yeah. I, I really enjoy that aspect of it. And I'm a sucker for this art style. Mm -hmm. When they make a movie look like, a, literally look like a comic book come to life, like with the, the inky blacks and yeah. the stark whites with the splash of color here or there. I'm just like, I'm drawn to it, man. I love it. Even... I mean, we'll talk about Spirit in a minute. Even though Spirit was like not a good movie, I still love the artistic style of it. And so like when they make movies like this, Spirit. It just really really oh, we'll get Don't there. Don't spoil it. <laughs> dog we'll shit. We'll get there. It's dog shit. Um when they make movies like this, it just really sells me on the whole concept and I, I'm just I'm 
sucked into the world. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I, I love this style. And I know Frank Miller did the Dark Knight Returns, I think the Batman uh, comic book with evil Superman or when they when Batman and Superman fight. I think if they were ever going to do like a, a real accurate comic book style of that, I think they should go with Frank Miller's artistic style and make it like this, like a Batman movie well, like this. Zack amazing. Snyder was really influenced yeah. by Frank Miller's style. But, you know, I can, I can remember collecting the Sin City comics when I was in high school and just being blown away. Like I was a huge Frank Miller fan um, of his Daredevil run and um, then going into The Dark Knight Returns. Like when I first read The Dark Knight Returns, that movie or that comic book like rocked me. It, it, it changed the way I, I looked at storytelling. It was, re it was a really seminal moment in the comic industry and in my development as a writer. Um, and so when Sin City came out, Frank Miller basically did something that no one else was doing at the time, which was he went back to stark um, black and white, like no grays. It was just like, it was either black or white and his art style and using that technique was just so innovative and original at the time. And uh, I can remember reading, you know, those comics and th the first Sin City movie is basically a collection of all the different like comic runs that he did. Cause uh, you know, um, like the Marv story, I think was like a three to six uh, like episode in, in the comic run, like, mm -hmm. you know, three to six comic books. Um, and then like, they just collected the full story and, told that story in the movie and it's the same with the yellow bastard and a bunch of other stuff and uh for the longest time nobody believed that these things could be adapted into a movie and then robert rodriguez comes along and he was like i got this shit yeah. <laughs> right he's like i just got done doing desperado uh -huh. well if, if you remember um so uh robert rodriguez had actually spent a lot of time with george lucas on the digital camera technology that he was pioneering for the the prequels and um, Rob Rodriguez is someone who's very much into like the low budget filmmaking and stuff like that. And so shooting on digital just allows you to move faster and you don't have to light it as much and it's cheaper to, you know, film and do things. And so he was really big into like this digital technology of filming, you know, movies. And, uh, you know, he got some cameras from George Lucas and he didn't even have the rights to Sin City. He'd been wanting to do a Sin City adaptation for a long time. He didn't have the rights to it. So he gets Josh Hartnett and uh, this other girl to come in on a green screen at his home studio for like a day. And he shoots the opening to this movie. And then like he goes and he does like all the post-production on it. He makes it look just like the comic book. And then he goes to Frank Miller and he's like, this is what I want to do. And Frank Miller's like, yes, I'm on board. And then they went to Harvey Weinstein and, um, you know, Harvey Weinstein now, you know, you yeah. know say his name and, and it's, uh, back in the day though, he was like a big time producer, Harvey Weinstein, you know, you say his name now and it's kind of up there with Hitler, you know, like yeah. just got all these negative connotations to it. This but, episode of Salty Nerd Podcast, we say Hitler and, and Harvey Weinstein. Get used to it. Yeah. <laughs> we talk about weird Adult shit. language. <laughs> but, but the Weinsteins were, um, these producers who were willing to take risks on stuff that your typical Hollywood studio wouldn't. And so when um, Robert Rodriguez went to the Weinsteins with this like short, like kind of opening, they're like, we want to make a whole movie like this in black and white mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And, and you, you tell people that you want to make a movie in black and white and instantly have, like the producer like, no, no, it's gotta be in color. Um, but uh, basically he took all the comic books and used them as his storyboards. And he kind of um, set out and had this whole presentation with this like short film that he had made and everyone just got really excited about it and decided to go ahead and do it. And this is the most, in fact, uh, Robert Rodriguez, he doesn't even call it an adaptation. He calls it a translation. So yeah. he basically just took what was on the page and says, like, I'm just going to put it on screen. Yeah. And uh, I think it worked beautifully. I, I, remember, I remember when this movie came out and it was just like, this is the comic book on the movie screen. Yeah. And I have to admit, it was incredible. Um, th they, there's nothing been, there hasn't been anything made since that compares not even the sequel no yeah. and and it's just it's a it's a really kind of amazing movie you yeah. know it's, it's a just, piece of art it, like it, I, I know really I, is. I always kind of chuckle at people who are like oh this movie is a piece of art like i kind of like yeah okay whatever yeah to be artistic and fartsy about it but like literally i mean this movie is a piece of it's, art <laughs> it's it's kind of a weird movie yeah it's a little weird but it's I, a little weird and it's um, very weird yeah it's uh 
it, but it's fun. It's cool. It it um it it keeps you at least at least at least, at least keeps you interested. Oh, for sure. And and you know, and I didn't like I hadn't watched this movie probably five six years, like like you'd said. Mm-hmm. And um, but next thing I knew, it was over, and I'm like, oh man, I was just like I like went way faster than I thought it was going to. Yeah. And um, the characters are cool in here, you know, and Marv. I love Marv. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, I, in a minute, I'm gonna ask everybody what their favorite storyline is. Yeah. But and um. It's just, you know, it's just, it's just, it's just, it's a cool movie and, and, and it's very atmospheric and it's very different and hasn't really been replicated. So yeah. What I love. Oh, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, this is one of the first movies to utilize what's called the digital backlot where basically everything in this movie, like I, I think with the exception of the bar, everything in this movie was shot on a green screen soundstage and everything was put in in Uh post-production. So um, it it was kind of like Robert Rodriguez was experimenting with like all digital filmmaking where you'd have the digital sets and the digital props and, you know, uh, pretty much everything but the actors was put in in post. Mm -hmm. And and it was very innovative at the time, especially with like his choices in color palette and stuff like that. Um, It was just something that no one had ever seen before and it it was you know outside the comic book and uh it was just it was really cool yeah and uh, one of the things that i really love about it is how frank miller in the comic and also when they translated it to the movie it it leans so hard into that like detective noir the the way people talk the conversations that they have and just the like you said the atmosphere that it has it it feels so like it's from the thirties. Like that's, yeah, it's, that's it's the very much inspired by film noir. Yeah. I love that aspect of it. And I know like there's other film noir movies, like legit movies that are full color, like normal production movies. But like, for whatever reason, when I think of like, when somebody says film noir, like I, I snap to this movie, like, mm-hmm. Oh, that's freaking sin city. A hundred percent. Like that's what it, the true form of noir is supposed to look like. It's supposed to be this real inky black and white. We should do a noir week. I would love to noir November. Yeah. I dig it. <laughs> um, okay, so real quick, I wanted to ask everybody a question. When I was watching this movie, I had a thought because we had been watching um, a lot of newer Bruce Willis movies, mm-hmm. and we kind of talked about how Bruce Willis fallen out of grace as far as like he just does not give a crap anymore. Right. I was watching this, and I'm like, Bruce Willis in this movie is still Bruce Willis. Mm-hmm. I don't, he, uh-huh. I don't see him acting very much in this movie, but he's so damn good. He's Do you think that was man. just like? You know, perfect casting when, when we were watching this i turned to jude and i was like i really missed the days where bruce willis cared yeah. do you think he yeah. cared or do you think it was just the perfect casting for the character no i think he cared he did? at this point okay yeah. i think it was kind of both a lo- yeah because yeah. like he's not there's no i can't say there's any range to his character he's very monotone but that's kind of how the character is well you know like quentin tarantino dusted him off of the bin of like hollywood ruined careers and um saved his, his butt basically and gave him a career resurgence. And so, um, Tarantino and, um, Rodriguez, their involvement in this, like he basically stepped up to their level mm-hmm. where he was like, okay, they're doing something different. They're doing something new. They're doing something exciting. I respect these guys. If Bruce Willis respects the filmmaker he's working with, he's going to put in effort. If mm-hmm. he doesn't, he's just going to phone it in. Mm-hmm. And, uh, the only person I think actually phoned in their, performance here was uh, Michael Madsen. I was just going to say. Like like the minute Michael Madsen opens his mouth in this movie, I'm just like, oh. Damn it, Hardigan. I won't let you do this. You're going to get yourself killed. You're going to get us both killed. Wait, what are you doing, dude? Which character does he play? He's he's the the, the cop that shoots him. Oh, okay. Yeah, he's been phoning it in for a while. (laughs) (laughs) He's, he's, uh, I think the last movie I saw him in where he might have cared a little bit was like Kill Bill Volume 2. He he, he (laughs) plays plays the the exact same character in Dying is Easy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. (laughs) Well, but but what's funny is that he was the last guy who was cast and he basically ran into Robert Rodriguez at like some type of party or uh, film function. Mm -hmm. And he was like, hey man, when are you going to cast me in one of your movies? And he's like, well, I got this part in... Sin City movie I'm doing. He's like, I'll take it. <laughs> and, and, and because he's, he's like a Tarantino like guy. he's picking out apples. I'll take two. Yeah. Yeah. But like, because he's a Tarantino guy, Robert mm-hmm. Rodriguez just cast him. But like, he is the worst actor in this whole movie. Oh, for sure. <laughs> yeah. There's but a lot of actors in this movie. There's a ton. This cast a lot of really huge. good actors in yeah. this movie. Uh, Clive yeah. Owen. Like, yeah. I remember when Clive Owen was like, second fiddle to only to James Bond. Like, he was on his way up the ranks in, in Hollywood. He did what? Uh, Children of Men and a bunch of other cool movies. Shoot him yeah. up. I think it was a crazy like comic book movie that he did one time. Did you see that? Like Clive Owen, to me, like Clive Owen is like you if you put him in the right role, he's stellar. I've liked Clive Owen since he appeared in Privateer 2. Um 
which was a video game <laughs> uh, way back in the early 90s. It was one of those CD-ROMs that he played like the main character in. Nice. Um, but uh, any movie that can make Elijah Wood scary as fuck. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Is, he really it, is. is the sign of like yeah. a good movie. Yeah. 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 It was cool. And um, like Carla Gugino is like fully naked, but it's not like overly sexualized. It's just like a part of the story. Yeah. yeah. And it's what, gorgeous. What, what's funny is so Jessica Alba, you know, she plays a, a character in this and she's a stripper and she had agreed to do the movie before she had read any of the comics. She didn't know anything about it. And when she found out how like hypersexualized her character was, because in the comics, her character is like up on stage naked. Um, she has it in her contract that she never does nudity. And so she went to Robert Rodriguez and Frank Miller and she was like, Hey, I didn't know there was going to be nudity in this. I don't do that. And Frank Miller and Robert Rodriguez were like, yeah, okay. Like they didn't fight her on it. They, they weren't <laughs> we'll like, you have to get naked. They were yeah. like, they were like, and her character is still so sexy. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah the sure. freaking oh, oh yeah. With cowgirl. Yeah. yeah. With, with those uh, buttless chaps. Heck yeah. <laughs> Every woman in this movie is fucking gorgeous yeah. like even insanely yeah. gorgeous yeah and that's right they, out of the comics too they, they even make uh rory gilmore hot yeah. <laughs> right oh yeah. sugar you just made the worst mistake of your whole life <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh the girls at old town that man. was like my favorite part of this movie because i'm watching it and oh. I, I told my wife i go hey you want to see your girl rory look like a total raging hoe <laughs> it's like look check this out <laughs> she looks good oh man <laughs> just yeah. oh my god that really is isn't it yeah. <laughs> And yeah. Rosario Dawson. Oh, Rosario Dawson's amazing. She, she looks great. Now. Brittany She's Murphy. She's a badass. Brittany Murphy is gorgeous. Jamie King is just ethereal. Yeah. You, wow. you, know, you know, it's funny. As, as Jude and I were watching this movie, we, we kept looking at all the actors who are now dead. Oh, I know. You know like, it's like, so sad. Like who? Uh, well, Brittany Murphy. Brittany Murphy. Brittany Murphy's gone. Is dead. Uh, Powers Booth. How did she die? I didn't know she was dead. Uh, she, I think she, it was drug she related. Bought, oh. She bought Britney Spears's old haunted house and died in it. And <laughs> oh, then her great. husband died in it too. Are you? Look wow. it up. Seriously? Yes. That's not like a... Th no. Britney Spears bought a house and was like, I think there's a demon in my house. <laughs> she had an exorcist come and exercise the house. And then she was like, I still don't feel safe in this house. So she sold it to Brittany Murphy. Brittany Murphy bought it and died in the house. And so did her husband. Wow. I actually think it was drug related. If I remember correctly, mm -hmm. um, I'm going to go with, I'm going to go with think. demon possession. <laughs> but, uh, Look it up. Rut Rut Rutger oh. Hauer is, is uh, dead. Um, you know, like he was in this, man, there's just so many actors who, who have since passed away, um, mm -hmm. who were involved in this movie. It's kind of weird. Yeah. Yeah, it is weird. But you well, know, what's weird is how old this movie is. Been fifteen is already. years. Mickey already. Rourke is still alive, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah he's still alive. Um, okay, so um, let's do uh, which which storyline is your favorite and why? Uh, I'm going to start with Jude. Which one did you really kind of like dive into and connect to? Was it Clive mm. Owens? Was it Mickey Rourke's or Bruce Willis's? Um, gosh, I don't know. I'm just so taken with every like female character in in this that i think i connect with all of them mm. i um i connected with skinny little nancy who like fell in <laughs> fell in love with the man who saved her when she was what like eight years yeah. old and is waiting for him to get released and come back to her so that they can be together and then like the ending of their storyline is so tragic but he he saves her again but yeah. old by, man dies yeah by little girl lives yeah fair trade uh, <laughs> and then i love the shelly storyline where her boyfriend's like beating her up and then she meets a man that protects her from him but then he gets in over his head and and then he has this like checkered past with these hookers from you know <laughs> uh and 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 rosario dawson is the woman of his dreams basically. of his dreams yeah. that he will always love and also never love like that's just so it's just such a sexy story yeah. And I love Goldie, be mostly because she's so beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> and then her twin sister, like her Wendy, va right? her vow to like um, avenge her sister's death. And then when she realizes that Marv wasn't the one that killed her sister, then she she becomes in league with him. Mm -hmm. I'm like the only storyline that I'm not on board with is like the cannibal. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I don't eat the, the, he's a freak. He's a freako, man. Which uh, which one was your favorite, Vader? Um, well, I I'm always gonna be partial to Marv. Yeah. I really like Marv. He's, Marv's a badass. He's a badass. That's he's, a mighty he, nice coach you got there. He's so over the top <laughs> with his band-aids. I love the description just, of him that I think it was Clive Owen that had it in his story. He was like, Marv, he belongs. He was born in the wrong century. Yes. He belongs on the battlefield with uh -huh. an axe or yeah. something like that. I'm like, that's such a classic. Like Matt Vader 70 Thor. Yeah. Like the, the, the god of salt and thunder himself. Born in the wrong century. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's right. 
Right on. Uh, yeah. What else was what else about it that uh, really draws you to it? I I don't know, man. I just there's just something about his story that I just I just enjoy. I watch the way he narrates his own mm. his own story through everything, and you know how basically nothing can stop him, and he's just a tank. He's just a tank. Yeah, yeah he's just like <laughs> he's and, the he's, and he's, and he's nimble. Like he jumps off the the stairs and goes down like twenty stories and catches a rail and flips around. And yeah, he's just he's so comic booky and so cool, <laughs> mm-hmm. so over the top. It's just you know, it's just a, it's just a good. You know, and I think it's like he's the majority of the movie, right? He's like a good. He's a good chunk, but I think they split it up pretty yeah, evenly. Yeah, but. yeah, and it's just you know, don't cross him. Yeah, don't get on Marv's bad side. You're you're dead. I love the, remember the bartender who's like, "Who are you? You can't come in here!" And he yeah. just grabs right. his face and like squeezes his <laughs> eyeball. Who are you, Marv? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Did you guys notice that in the bar they were serving piss warm Django? No, I didn't, but that's amazing. That's great. <laughs> that, 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 that's a reference to other Robert Rodriguez. Like yeah. every Robert Rodriguez movie, he has like his things. Desperado movies. Yeah. So like he, the beer in his movies is Chango beer and mm-hmm. kind of like how Quentin Tarantino has red apple cigarettes mm-hmm. in all of his movies and right Big on. Kahuna Burger. Uh, Kadish, which one is your favorite storyline? So in the comics, my favorite was uh, A Dame to Kill For, and that was actually the first Sin City like series I read and that's kind of Dwight's origin story, the, the character that um, Clive, Owen. Clive Owen plays in this movie. And, uh, you know, he starts off as like this kind of like, f- like photographer who takes like pictures of people having affairs and, you know, he's like a private detective type yeah. guy or a, might be a tabloid guy. I, I forget, but um, he, he basically falls in love with this girl and she kind of ropes him into trying to murder uh, her rich husband. And it's this whole big, like femme fatale type thing. And he gets like super messed up and to the point where like he has to like get plastic surgery and he has like a whole new face. And so like it, the original Dwight didn't look like Clive Owen mm. uh, does. And so like when he comes back reborn to get revenge for what this woman did to him, uh, he's like, like super like badass. So in this movie, when Shelly references, like when you came back with your new face and all, like that was literally talking about a brand new face. Yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, Dwight basically, uh, in his first incarnation, he's, he's bald and he's like, what an upgrade. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. He, he got like hair plugs or something like that in the comics. But, um, basically the, the big black chauffeur guy uh, played by Michael Clark Duncan, who also passed away. Um, yeah he basically messed Dwight up, like almost killed him. And the girls from Old Town kind of rescued him and nursed him back to health. And that's kind of like how he had this. So like, there's like this whole backstory before we get to his story in Sin City, which happens after A Dame to Kill For. So A Dame to Kill For is kind of like a prequel to a lot of the the shorter, mm. like, like Marv's story and stuff like that. But in this movie, I'd have to say Marv is definitely my favorite storyline. And there are certain like scenes in the Marv story that are just straight from the comics. Like when he's going to the farm and he's like listing off like all of the, the tools he has and, he's, oh, yeah. and, and my mitts. My mitts. And uh, <laughs> um, like, like everything that you see on screen is like stri- a, a panel straight from the, the comic book. And it was kind of interesting because so Frank Miller didn't actually direct anything in this movie in the, in the traditional sense. Uh, once Robert Rodriguez brought him on board, he basically used all of Frank Miller's panels as the storyboard. And so everything Frank Miller drew is on screen pretty much. And for that reason, he wanted to give Frank Miller a co-directing credit, but the Directors Guild of America uh, said, no, like you can't give him a credit because he's not actually directing anything. And it was for that reason that Robert Rodriguez left the Directors Guild. Hmm. And because of that, he lost out on the opportunity to direct John Carter of Mars, mm. uh, which he was set up to do. Oh, man, um, that would have been a way better movie, probably. Yeah, probably. But uh, so like he was set to do that movie after Sin City. But because he lost his uh, his standing with the Directors Guild because he pulled out of it, uh, he had to drop out of that movie. And uh, Quentin Tarantino actually came in and he directed one scene in this film. And that was the scene where Dwight is driving in the car with the dead body. Uh, played by Benicio del Toro, and and so like uh, I, I think what happened was in Kill Bill Volume Two, Robert Rodriguez did some scoring for that movie, and Quentin Tarantino gave him like a dollar. It was one of those things where it was like, hey, can you come in and help me out? And uh, Quentin Tarantino said, in exchange, I will direct a scene in whatever movie you want me to do for one dollar. 
And so he called him in for this. And, and that scene where he's, where Clive Owens talking to Jackie boy, uh, was his all dead Tarantino. decapitated. Oh my God. Yeah. Good, good the stuff. way, the way, the way, he, oh my God, I can't talk. Um, the way he like changes his voice when he's back, the, hook, the hookers <laughs> let you down. That, 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 oh that, that, was, that was a Tarantino direct. Oh my God. I freaking love that scene. Like the, the direction of, I guess if he, if he told him to do that and it wasn't like ad libbed, but just like, because Miho, Mi, Miho, Miho. Yeah. Miho like slit his throat. Yeah. And so like when he's, his neck is up, so his voice is all messed up uh, and it comes down and it gets all deeper. No, no, Tarantino said, change your voice when like yeah. the, the throat wounds open. And, and it was funny because Benicio del Toro, like when, when he got cast, he came on and, and it was his idea for all that makeup that he wanted to, to do. And everyone's like, you could just show up as, as yourself. And he, he was like, no, nah, man, <laughs> like, I, I, I got to be in, in character. <laughs> That's and, awesome. And, and you can really tell like how into it everybody who's yeah. in this movie was. Yeah. Like everybody was so fully invested in it. And I think that there's something to like, there, it's equal parts like they were into it and also they were so well cast. Like, like Marv is so believable mm. as a comic book character. Yeah, I think this is one of my favorite Mickey Rourke performances. Mm -hmm. Like, I know oh, he... it's one of his best. Yeah, oh, for sure. 100%. Yeah. I, I know, like, in his earlier years, he did a lot of really good movies. Uh, and he's kind of fallen out of favor recently because he's kind of gone off the deep end. But, like, this movie, to me, like, that's a standout character. Yeah. And for, since we, do, we did our favorite moments, my favorite storyline is Marv's. Like, I, I'm a sucker for a classic revenge story. Mm -hmm. And when he's like... You know, like oh, Goldie came to me because I was the meanest and roughest looking dude out there and I failed to protect her and now I have to make it right. And he just like works his way up the food chain and all the way up to the bishop. And could you picture anyone but Mickey Rourke playing Marv? No, no, no. It, it, he, he really no. embodied that character. Oh, for sure. Yeah. No, but nobody else is Marv. Yeah, it's Absolutely perfect. Not. Absolutely perfect. And it's kind of funny because like this whole movie was shot at Robert Rodriguez's like home studio. <laughs> like, that, awesome. that I did not know. Yeah, that's, that's kind of awesome. Uh, like, like this wasn't a Hollywood production. Robert Rodriguez lives in Austin, Texas. He had all the actors fly out to like his place and he just had a sound stage with like all this green and blue screen set up and uh, shot everything like locally um, and around his house and uh made like this huge big budget movie for like 40 million dollars yeah but it looks like a much more expensive film yeah like that's honestly awesome. that's not a huge budget even for no. it being like almost 20 years ago but i mean it's it's beautiful it's so much fun to watch uh my i think i'm gonna comment a little bit on jude's point about um bruce willis's character with nancy uh, um that's my second favorite i i really enjoy that storyline and i wanted to just comment like at the end of that storyline where Nancy's like, I've been waiting for you. I love you. You know, you're the man of my dreams. I love that he stuck to his guns. And Me he's too. like, he's like, no, no, that's not what I'm here for. Because I love you, but I don't love you that way. The whole time <laughs> he was, he considered her like a, a daughter, daughter figure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm just, I'm super glad that they stuck to that and yeah. they didn't like let him cross over that threshold. Mm -hmm. That was a really good but, point. But you know, real life Bruce Willis would have tapped it. <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's do final thoughts for Sin City. Matt Vader, what do you got for us? Oh, I don't I don't know, man. It's it's just a fun movie. Um I remember being very much enthralled by this movie when it first came out. It was it was a lot of fun. It was very different. Mm -hmm. I'm like, wow, they're like literally putting a comic book on the screen. Yeah. I mean, it's 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 not even a uh an ad a uh, adaptation adaptation <laughs> is literal comic book this is what it looks like on the tv screen and yeah. it, it was cool man i really i thought it was neat um recommend I, people go check I, it out I, I oh yeah if you haven't seen this movie for sure absolutely go check it out um i don't know if i felt like the the, the gimmick had gotten a little old two hours into it i don't know maybe mm. a little bit um i don't know um but I, I I enjoyed it, and I, I enjoyed it then. I enjoy it now. Um, probably if I if I was going to score this movie, probably three and a half, three and a half. That's stars. it. Yeah. Oh wow. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Hmm. So, I mean, it's a little over the top. It's a little cheesy. That's kind of the point, though. Yeah. yeah I, I know. <laughs> I know it is. Are um, you scoring it as far as like general movie entertainment or as a comic book movie? Um, kind of both. Okay. Yeah, I mean, my wife wouldn't. She doesn't like this movie. Okay. You know, I, I have to come at it kind of from a nerd perspective. You know, um, it was cool at that point. Uh, general movie going, 
aren't going to be into it as much. So, you know, three and a half. I think that's a fair score. Okay, cool. So, yeah. Jude, final thoughts? Sin City? Um, this was my favorite that we watched for this week. And um, I don't know if, if I have anything else to say about it. I just think it's just so beautiful to watch. It's so beautiful to look at. I mean, um, the storylines... It's 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 hard not to be into this. Like I know I said like I I didn't get it when I first watched it. Um but I think I don't know. I've matured in my <laughs> movie watching. I don't know. I'm not um I'm also not into comic books. I I I've only invested in a couple of different ones. One was <clears throat> Walking Dead and, and Buffy. Um so I I have no basis of knowledge for the um source material but i had to work my way up to my appreciation for it and now for me it's it's a five out of five mm. um dames to kill for nice <laughs> <laughs> kadish final thoughts um so this was kind of like for comic book nerds who had been big on frank miller um for pretty much a decade before this movie came out um this was a very triumphant move to the big screen um, this movie was important for a lot of different reasons. First of all, it introduced the world to Frank Miller's stuff. Um, it, it's, it's probably the most, fa most faithful adaptation of a comic book to a big screen ever made. But the from a filmmaking point of view, the leaps in technology that this allowed, because like George Lucas, you know, like that was like, he was making Star Wars for hundreds of millions of dollars. This was made for 40 million and it was like all digital. And it's something that, still has effects today because nowadays with like a prosumer computer, someone sitting in their garage at home can make a movie that looks as good as this because of the technology that people like Robert Rodriguez mm -hmm. pioneered back in the day. And so like th this movie has far reaching um, influences out there. And as a Frank Miller fan of his older work, he's kind of fallen off the wagon in terms of like how good of a writer he is nowadays. <laughs> but for vintage Frank Miller stuff, like this was a fantastic adaptation. I didn't like it all that much when I first saw it in the theaters, but over time, the movie has kind of grown on me more. Same. Um, and I was kind of disappointed that the sequel didn't do as well because that was the adaptation of the storyline that yeah. was my favorite. Um, but I, I feel like by the time that one came out, people had kind of gotten burned out on Frank Miller. But I really like the visual style of it. I like um, everything. Like I like all the characters in, in these movies and if you're a fan of the comic book like there is this whole kind of like sin city noir world that frank miller created and it's really fun to get to see it come to life so i would highly recommend this movie i give it four out of five yellow bastards <laughs> <laughs> nice uh yeah for me like i don't say this often and lightly but this is a work of art to me I, I absolutely love this movie. I love all three storylines. I think the way that they intermingle and they cross together, it's like that classic Pulp Fiction chapter, you know, uh, what is it? Non-linear storytelling, I think is what they call it. I love that. Um, I, I don't have any salt for this movie. There's there's nothing I don't like about it. Uh, it's, it's a ton of fun. It's got a great revenge story. It's got great love interest stories. The women are freaking 10 out of 10s across yep. the board. Yep. The dudes are dudes, you know, like men are men in this movie. I love that. Like they're all there, like- There is no soy in this movie. Yeah, there's zero and soy. <laughs> and that's one of the great things about Frank Miller is like when he started doing stuff like Sin City, uh, you know, he did Sin City independently. It wasn't through like Marvel or DC or any of the big things. And once he was free from like the constraints of working for a big company, he went so hardcore with like the sex and the violence and all this other stuff. That, like you, you didn't see that in comics until Frank Miller started doing it. Yeah. I like, don't understand the phrase. There's no soy. In no. This. Okay. So like, like dudes nowadays, like California soy boys, like, Oh my God, I love you know like how, Metro how babies were raised on soy milk and therefore they're weaker than normal babies. Damn millennials. Is that, is that a real thing? Yeah. It's a thing. Yeah. Okay. It's like, a, it's an internet thing. thing more than anything else, oh, but okay. like there's no, there's no weak men in this movie like there's, there's no the, weakness in this there's movie. no weakness <laughs> the men who are the bad guys are the douchebags who are sexist and misogynist and the good guys are like fuck you don't mess with my chick i'm gonna beat the shit out of you if That's you right. do like men stand up for women in this movie like there's a whole aspect or of they it. eat them or they eat them <laughs> no but it's just like it's it's a whole aspect in this movie that i feel like is lacking in a lot of like nerd culture stuff nowadays where everybody has to be like pc and safe or well, this movie is not safe this is a very masculine movie yeah i love that that's what i love about this movie. i 
disagree. I mean, I what think mean? that the men are very masculine, but I think that the the women are also very badass. Oh no, no, like, 100%. there's just no weakness across the board in yeah, this yeah, movie. Yeah, no. yeah, like all of the women are tough as shit too. Yeah, and the, so are the men. Yeah. All the characters are very strong. And yes. that, and that's one of the things that I love about this is that they the the dames don't necessarily need to be rescued. Mm -hmm. You know, they're also badass. Yeah. And like Dwight comes and he's like, I'll take care of this. And, and they're like, like, we've got this. Yeah, we've got it. <laughs> deadly little Miho. Yes. I freaking love that. Yeah. She's the tiniest one in the whole movie and she's the deadliest. Yeah. It's yeah. awesome. It's cool. All right, cool. Yeah. I give it a, uh, for me personally, it's five out of five. This is, this is, as far as like comic book adaptation goes, I feel it's like you the, guys are very it's, liberal with the five out of five stars. Five out of five. It's not a star. It's a. It's not Indiana Jones, it's, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a five out of five. Deadly little Mios. You're, you're saying it's a perfect movie. It's a perfect movie. It's, it's a perfect it's, comic book movie. So when I give my okay. ratings, it's based on what kind of movie we're watching. All right. When I so, give my ratings, it's based off of entertainment level. For you. For me, personally. Which is a little more. Because this is the Salty later. Nerd podcast where the rules are made up and the points don't matter. That's right. That's that's how it is. So three out of five is, is cool. Three I'm and a, a half. I'm a five. Out, sorry, three out three and a half. I'm a five out of five, man. I'm entertained from start to finish. I love it. My There's, votes are always based on like, we're watching a comic book movie. Uh, what kind of comic book movie is this? For yeah. me, five out of five. Right on. Okay. All right, guys, that's it for our discussion of Sin City. Highly recommend go checking it out. Uh, before we move on, a quick word from our sponsors. I have to pee. <laughs> Leave that in. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. Hey, if you would like to support the podcast, don't forget to go to saltynerdclub.com and join our Patreon club. Patreon club. There you can uh, get access to all kinds of really cool stuff, like we do exclusive podcasts, behind-the-scenes photos. You guys get to have contact with the host of the podcast. And uh, also a little bit of sway when it comes to what we review. You guys can mention uh, movies that you might want us to talk about, and we'll put them on our list. That's saltynerdclub.com. Join our Patreon club and uh, you know help support the podcast. And Matt Vader would like to remind you that there is a $3 tier now for those people who, uh, you know, you don't want to do the $5 tier, but you still want to get in on the base level. You can get some cool access to there's, content for $3. There's a not a lot of difference. <laughs> it's our incentive. If you, know? you want to get something for as close to nothing as possible, the $3 <laughs> tier is for you. Just come check it out. There we yeah. go. All right, guys. The next movie on our list is the, is this Zack, Zack Snyder, right? Yep. Zack, Zack Snyder, Snyder movie 300 based off of the, the Frank Miller uh, comic book. Uh, Jude, take it away. What is this movie all, right. all about? 2006, 300. Rated R with a runtime of one hour and five. That can't be right. One hour, five minutes? No. That can't be right. No. 50 minutes. It's got to be 50 right. minutes. <laughs> <laughs> We're professionals. <laughs> uh, had a budget of 65 million. What do you think it brought in? Uh, I'm going to say another 150. Vader? I agree. Four hundred fifty-six million dollars. Yeah. <laughs> wow! I didn't Way know Way to that go! Big. This yeah, movie awesome. blew everyone Hell away. Yes. So Hell yes. King Leonidas refuses to submit to the vast Persian army. Xerxes goes real, real bonkers that the Spartans would dare defy him. He sends regiment after regiment after them to no avail, leading to the Battle of Thermopylae, where three hundred stood against a legion. <sighs> Fun fact, Kadish was actually at the Battle of Thermopylae because we had our past lives read once, and oh turns my. out he was there. You were a Spartan warrior? I was. I know it's hard to believe, <laughs> but uh, Jude and I went to a psychic, and she like read our past lives. And one of them nice. was like, she was like, oh, you were a, a Spartan warrior, and you died at the Battle of Thermopylae. I was like, oh. Okay. That sounds right. Yeah. Hoo -ah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you know, so like the the but the gross for this movie, close to five hundred million dollars, um, surprised everyone. And I attribute that entirely to the trailer with the nine inch nails song. <laughs> I remember when that trailer hit, everyone was like, what is this uh -huh. movie? I'm going to need to rewatch that. Yeah, yeah. We need to watch yeah. the trailer. And, and, and like, like the, cause Zack Snyder, he came from music video background. And right. so like, you know, he's really good at making like music video type stuff where, you know, you have like the beautiful visuals set to like pulse pounding music. And when you have that moment where in the trailer where, uh, Gerard Butler says, this is Sparta. And he like kicks the guy. And then all of a sudden mm -hmm. the nine inch nails just comes crashing down. And everyone's like, oh my God, yeah. oh, you're yeah. going to lose their yeah. mind. I got goosebumps just talking about <laughs> I, it. I remember when this movie came out, man. It was, yeah. it was something. It was 2008, right? Uh, th there was so much hype. For this 2006. Movie. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay, cool. Yeah, this, this came out right after Sin City. And there was so much hype for this movie. Like everyone wanted to go see it. Yeah. 
I remember seeing this in the theater when it came out and uh, I was with my, my ex at the time. And I remember like turning and looking at him and being like, can you look like that? <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, I just That's remember, what I think every time. I'm I like, can turning, I look like that? <laughs> never mind. Sorry. Go ahead, June. I keep interrupting you. It doesn't matter now. It's not funny. Oh. <laughs> I <laughs> no, killed it. I remember, I remember turning to him in the theater, like in the middle of, of one of the fight scenes. I forget which one. Uh, and just being like, this movie's amazing. Yeah. Like, this is a really good movie. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, again, this is another movie I have no salt for whatsoever. No. I this, love it from beginning to end, the artistic style. It's not quite the same as, as Sin no. City because it's not the stark black and white, but it does mess a lot with that color aspect where things are, yeah, you know. It's very desaturated. Yeah, I, I, I think it's just, it's another one of those things that's just a work of art on screen. And This, this is probably one of my top, 10 movies really top yeah. 10 wow yeah well, you're the one that de that decided that we should watch this yeah well yeah. i said comic book movies and we went with this and yeah sin city and, and sin city and then the next one we're going to talk about <laughs> <laughs> got kind of thrown in at the end but um yeah man this movie is everything i want in a comic book movie you know it's it's just it's stylized it's it's action filled it's there's not a ton of dialogue in this thing, you know, it's, it's very, but it's memorable, mm. you know, I mean, there's quotes from this movie, man, my hair is falling off. There's, <laughs> there's quotes from this movie that we all still say to this day, you, you know, it's oh, just, yeah. um, you know, it's just a cool movie. You know, you know, I, I get, I, 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 I get pumped up when I watch this movie. Oh, for sure. dude. I want to go like, kick somebody's ass i, I want to go work like, out i'm like yeah, oh my yeah. god i need like, to go oh. to the gym <laughs> and then i gotta get that six pack. Like, so, so you know yeah. the guy who invented crossfit was the one who trained all the actors for this and in fact his crossfit um like routine mm -hmm. s stemmed from this movie yeah and he did it so like the actors never did the same exercise twice their bodies couldn't adapt to the exercises because he was constantly changing it up. They were in the gym for four hours a day, every day. Mm -hmm. It was crazy, like, how in shape these guys got. I think, is it safe to say that this is what started the comic book superhero trend of having uh, the actors just get into freaking crazy, incredible shape? No. Um, what, like, what came out before this? Well, that would have... what happened was, I think it was around the time uh, of The Matrix, the first Matrix, where uh, the filmmakers decided that they were going to train the actual actors to do like the stunts on screen, so mm -hmm. like they could actually show the actors doing it instead of having to, you know, film around their um, their stunt doubles. And I think ever since the Matrix, um, like that started the trend in Hollywood of mm -hmm. actors actually training to become, uh, you know, uh, or to be able to do a lot of the stuff that their characters do because it's much more translatable to have an actor learn how to do martial arts than it is to train a martial artist to act yeah yeah um okay so for me i just i don't know i kind of already said that there's nothing i don't like about this movie but oh i was gonna say there was one thing that i really thought was really cool um there's an interview with gerard butler uh when he was talking about this movie and um he was talking about the, the very famous scene where he's like, this is Sparta. And he mm -hmm. kicks the dude into the endless well. He was like, on the script, it was just written as I'm supposed to say, this is Sparta. As almost like it was a matter of a fact. You know, it wasn't supposed to be dramatic or anything like that. And he went to Zack Snyder and he's like, hey man, I, I want to try something, but I don't know, like, I don't know if it's going to come off really well. Just let me know. And he, he tried, he went freaking dialed it up to Full 11. Mm -hmm. And he was like, this is Sparta. And he just nails the dude. Yeah. And Zach was like, oh my God, that's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> he's like, are you sure that wasn't over the top? And he's like, do it every time. <laughs> so from like that moment on, every time Leonidas speaks, it's just dialed up to yeah. 11. You know what I think my favorite part about Leonidas is though? The beard. Well, he does rock a good <laughs> beard. He's got a good six pack and he's badass in this whole movie. Yeah. Uh, but um, he's all about his wife. Yeah. Oh, dude. That's okay. He doesn't do anything without thinking about her. Yeah. And even at that, this is Sparta scene. He looks over and she nods. And she nods at him. Do Lena, it. Is it Lena do Haiti. How, how do you say her name? You know, she's, she's the epitome of strong woman. Yeah. Yeah. And I love her character. And I love the relationship that they have yes. too. Yeah. Cause he's like, yeah, he's the freaking ultimate man's man, mm -hmm. but he's still like, Checking with his his it, number, it, his, it his significant me, other. It reminds me of a saying my wife has, because my wife is very much I, I she, she's the alpha, mm -hmm. and I have zero issues with that. <laughs> but she's also very traditional. My wife is, 
you know, she's very old school. You know, she's like husband is is the man of the household. But but there's this thing that she says. She goes, "You might be the head of the household, but on the neck that that head pivots on." Mm-hmm. And That's you, also a line from a movie. Is it? You, I, yeah. I did not know my this. big fat Greek wedding. But um, <laughs> what? I, I didn't mean to know that. No, no, it's fine. That's good. <laughs> I'm glad that she watches movies. But that uh, that's always kind of stuck with me, and it's very true. And yeah. it, it kind of is the way this relationship works in this movie. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I just appreciate that. There, yeah. There's there's a great line in this movie mm-hmm. where she kind of speaks to Xerxes. Um, like messenger mm-hmm. and he's like who is this woman yeah. that she oh, dare yeah. speak to me that's like at that point and, you're like you're dead dude. and 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 she she's she's like uh spartan women are the only ones who give birth to actual men yeah <laughs> and kind of put them in this place yeah and that's one of the things that i love about this movie like um you know most movies are, are very like what what you were saying earlier about like um, men are men and they rescue the women but in this men and women are equal because they're mm-hmm. all Spartans mm-hmm. and I love that scene that Kate has just said like when the messenger comes and he's like how dare this this woman speak to me yeah. and she's like you're not even a man yeah. I'm more of a man <laughs> it's so badass I love the relationship and, and it continues on throughout the entire movie that moment where he's trying to decide what to do he knows like in order to save Sparta I have to break the rules that these morons are trying to tell me to follow. It's like, we're just going to go for a walk. And she's like, she's like, you know, they're in bed yeah, together. Yeah, he's very much up against the deep state. Yeah. 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 In Sparta. <laughs> and, and, and she's like, you know, don't ask yourself what a king would do. What would a free man do? And he yeah. just looks at her like, my God, you're a goddamn beautiful genius. Yes. And they just, I mean, the, yeah, the teamwork together and, and is amazing. And she says, either come back on your shield or not at all. Yeah. yeah. Oh gosh, man. It's so good. So good. Okay. So this is great setup for why, I've watched this movie a million times, but for whatever reason, this weekend watching it for the podcast, it hit me a little different. And at the end of the movie, when, you know, he's decided to take his last stand and, you know, the arrows are coming at him and he's like, my wife, my queen, my Mm -hmm. love. Like I started getting like a little teary eyed. I was like, God damn it. This movie's too freaking good. Sorry. And, uh, it was, it just spoke to that whole, the whole, uh, setup for him and his wife being as, as one, you know, they mm-hmm. were so in one thought and they were a team. It just, I don't know, man, it hit me real hard this time around. Yeah. I don't know why. Maybe it's cause I got kids now. Strong relationships are important, man. It's great, dude. It's so great. And uh, like, <laughs> there's no soy in this movie either. There's no, no, there's no weakness <laughs> no. whatsoever. <laughs> uh, do you guys do you have, have any, it, do you have a least favorite part? Uh, least favorite part. Um, <sighs> I can't think of anything off the top of my head. I, I, my, the first thing that goes to my head is um, the 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 messed up guy, the mutant guy. What was his name? Thanopolis or something, something like, that. like that. The hunchback. Yeah, the hunchback guy. Um, I think they went a little overboard on the grotesque side for his scene. That, it, that was right from the comics. I, yeah. I, yeah, I understand. That's Frank Miller's style. He goes like over the top. But I think like just when he's walking in in front of Xerxes and he's like seeing all these like weirdos and freaks and stuff, I, I, it always kind of it's a little off putting for me. Uh, it's not my favorite part of the movie, but that's like super nitpicky. That, it's not at all like a criticism. It's just me personally. I'm like, I mean, uh, they, they I don't go, have to watch this part. <laughs> they go a little over the top with with the grotesqueness of the bad people. Yeah, and I I like that. I do, I do too for the most part. The guy because, with like because, the the, well, yeah. the yeah, sword but, hands. You know, everybody that's bad in this movie is kind of gross looking. Yeah, even the other Spartan dude that that's well, I forget his name the. Uh, what's the guy that like the traitor, the traitor dude, even he, Oh yeah. Even he has like really like some features that are kind of like, they go out of the, you know, this guy's a bad dude, right? Yeah. And the, the, you know, and even in the Oracle priest, they're gross and diseased and (laughs) and, licking that girl. Yeah. The, prognosticator yeah, I mean, like, of prognosticators. You know who the bad people are and who the good people are in this movie just by how good looking they are or yeah. the opposite of. And, um, you know, and I kind of thought that was cool too. The over the top exaggerated weirdness of, of the bad guys mm-hmm. and all the different types of soldiers that they come across. And, I forgot Michael and, Fassbender was in this movie. This was and, his first and, movie. This is his first ever movie? Yeah, this was the, the very first movie he's ever appeared in. Oh my in. gosh, what a memorable role, too. Yeah, it was our all arrows, Hill. Our arrows will blot out the sun, <laughs> and we will fight in the shade. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then, then, love then it, later dude. on, they're like, you had to say it. Yeah, you yeah. had to say it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's do... Uh, that, that's a very famous line. Yeah, it's great. And, and you know what, what's interesting about this? So there, there are two factors in this movie. The first, of course, is Frank Miller. And ever since he was a kid... 
uh, Frank Miller has been obsessed with the Battle of Thermopylae. Like he saw this movie uh, from a filmmaker named Rudolf Maté, and it was called The 300 Spartans. It came out in 1962. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically when he was a kid and he saw this, he was so like blown away by the actual story and it altered his perception of what a hero was in so far as he came to realize that the hero didn't always win and that sometimes the hero has to sacrifice himself in order to do the right thing and that really kind of impacted his form of storytelling and if you look at like his run on like daredevil and even in sin city like he throws in kind of nods to the spartans and thermopylae there was a, a scene in the, the sin city movie actually that was taken from the comics where uh, they funnel all the bad guys into an alleyway where their numbers don't mean anything. And that was straight from like the hot gates of the Battle of Thermopylae. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Frank Miller like has carried this story with him for a long time. And he finally was able to tell it in a comic book format. And uh, the 300 comic book itself, it's like a coffee table book almost. It's 16 by nine. Uh -huh. So it's not like a typical like comic book like shape and so he could do like these really expansive like panels and stuff like that and it's it's more of a straightforward this is the story as opposed to the movie which actually expanded on a lot of like the characters like the wife wasn't a big part of the comic book um but the the other aspect to this is Zack snyder and Zack snyder this was his second movie right off of uh dawn of the dead is, is that or yeah, day sounds of, right yeah day of the dead dawn. dawn dawn okay so this was his second movie after dawn of the dead and he approached this movie very much like he did that movie where he shot it in chronological order because, you know, like he didn't know that like you, you could shoot stuff out of sequence. It still <laughs> seems weird to me when I hear people say that and I'm like, how do you do that? I, but, but continue. But, so, but Zack Snyder being the, the visualist that he is, he, he always loved Frank Miller's stuff. And when Sin City kind of hit, like he was like, I, I've always wanted to do, you know, 300. And so like he basically took the comic book and had it adapted into a digital animated comic where like they just took the frames from the book and added some like effects to mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And um, he then went and did like a short film um, where kind of similar to what Robert Rodriguez did, but a little bit more involved where he showed this like two minute sequence of the camera going 360 degrees around these two Spartan warriors who were fighting, you know, um, Persians. And in fact, I think you can see it on one of the special editions of, of the DVD, what he did. And it was a, a, a VFX test to just show what he pictured in his head for how he was going to do this movie. And that combined with the motion comic that he had created uh, was able to sell the executives on on this, this film. They're like, okay, you want to do this movie, you can do this movie. And they kind of wanted it to be on the same level of success as Sin City to gross about 70 million domestic or whatever. And when this movie made half a billion dollars, every, <laughs> everyone was like, holy crap. And this is really the thing that launched um, Zack Snyder's career and got him in the door with Warner Brothers in terms of all the DC Universe stuff because he was like the comic book guy. And I've always said that, you know, because he's a, he's a um, Frank Miller guy and he, he's into Batman and stuff like that, uh, he was hired to do Superman. And so for the sequel to Man of Steel, he basically did a backdoor Batman movie because yeah. that's the thing he wanted to do. <laughs> and the Batman versus Superman was straight from The Dark Knight Returns. Like he used uh, the fight in that movie as the basis for the whole movie Batman versus Superman, which leads into Justice League, which leads into... Yeah. The, Is that why you're wearing that shirt today? Yes. It was, it was, <laughs> it was my Zack Snyder shirt. <laughs> um, but, you know, it leads into the uh, the Snyder cut and all his other stuff. And it all starts with this movie because this is really the movie. I, I'd say it's his best movie. And this is the movie that created the Snyder cult. Mm. Like, like this was the genesis of it. Because before then, he'd made this one zombie movie and it was good. But this movie put him on a different level in terms of like his visual style. Like he became like a a filmmaker to watch because mm -hmm. of this film. I think, oh, go ahead, Jude. No, you've been waiting. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, uh, so um, there is one thing that I wanted to kind of touch on is that um, this is a comic book movie that I think a lot of people who know the source material, they flocked to the theaters to see this. Um, and then because of that crazy trailer, like everyone else went and saw it too. But um, there is a terrible domino effect that, um, was created because this movie was so successful is that every douchebag in a bar, guy in a bar 
before or after they had a fight in a bar said, this is Sparta. Really? And yeah, it's just so cringy and eye rolling. And it's one of the best parts of this movie. And now when I see it, I just have to, I can't help but roll my eyes. Overused. And like, oh, God. This is a curb stomp. Every broided out guy who had too much tequila and he couldn't yeah. handle it. This is for you. I've never done that. I've never done that either. So you can handle your drink. But I'm not a roid headed yeah, get some this, this movie does make me want to go work out, though. Oh, gosh, well, dude. yeah, you have to. This movie, I think, is what sold me on Gerard Butler as being like the action yeah. hero guy. I, I'm a sucker for that dude's movies now, and I think it's because of this movie. <laughs> yeah, but but you know who my he, favorite? He likes eating cheeseburgers. Now. I know, I know. Oh, yeah. I love it too because I, I see him <laughs> me in like <laughs> I see him in modern movies and like modern like internet uh, interviews and stuff like that, and like, he's just like, guys. dude, God, he looks so good. I have a man crush on Gerard Butler. Did, did you ever hear about that story about how like um, there was a reporter who was interviewing Zoe Saldana for the Guardians of the Galaxy and the Avengers movies? And, uh, you know, she, she was like, you know, is it hard being the only woman among like all these men, like Chris Pratt and, uh, and, um, Hemsworth guy, and yeah, Chris Hemsworth, the guy who plays Captain America. Um, it, it's, it's like, you know, it, Vin se Diesel. It, it seems like there are a lot of boys, you know, there, do, do they ever like do like locker room talk and make you feel uncomfortable? And she's like, actually, the only thing they really talk about is what they want to eat <laughs> <laughs> because they're all on such restrictive diets. Oh my diets. God, how many times have we sat and watched Chris Pratt's uh, YouTube or, oh, or yeah. his Instagram mm. about what he wants like, to this, eat? What's my snack? <laughs> what's my snack? <laughs> like every, he has all the proportions. Yeah. Yeah. Every time I'm on a diet and I walk through the house, I'm like, I'm so hungry. <laughs> <laughs> what's my snack? He's got like a cucumber roll or something. He's like, this is going to taste great. He's like, okay, this is for tomorrow. So, but I'm just gonna have a bite. I'm just gonna have a bite. I hate it. Oh, man. Yeah, but the guys who were in this movie, they look good. Yeah. Oh but, yeah. But man, did they have to suffer for for that? Oh, like, like, like it was the most intense training. Even the guy who created CrossFit, he was like, I don't think I'd ever put anyone else through this type of training because <laughs> it's it, like like they actually ran the danger of getting overtrained yeah. in their yeah. training. And uh, I think Gerard What's Butler. What's that mean? You can go to the point of, of above failure, above and beyond failure, and you can actually do more damage than good oh, yeah. when it comes to working out. Huh. So if you like... If <laughs> I've you, never done that. <laughs> <laughs> neither have I, but I know it can happen. Uh, I know that that's just something that like hardcore trainers, especially in the Hollywood environment for these superhero movies and stuff like that, they have to be real careful not to burn the actors out because they can end up mm -hmm. backfiring on them. I think it's kind of funny how we never talked about the actual main character of these movies when people talk about him. What, yeah. Leonidas? No, Del Delius. The guy who was telling the story. Oh, the narrator. Yeah, he's, he's a he's a badass he's, too. He, I think he's my favorite, one of my favorite characters. Yeah, you, you know the interesting thing about this story is they actually fictionalized a lot of it because the mm. historical Delios, he was considered a coward because he got like an eye infection and Leonidas dismissed him, <laughs> and and because he was the only survivor of the Battle of Thermopylae, people just saw him as oh you abandon your post you're a coward and so <laughs> no. like it was it wasn't the same thing as what happened. <laughs> There's the a movie. lot of historical differences this movie. <laughs> and that's okay. Yeah, uh, it's fine. Like, it's like even after at the very end when he's like now they're facing ten thousand Spartans, they still lost that fight. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but we don't think about that. Um, Kish, do you uh, want to talk about like your perspective of having been there? Like, is there anything <laughs> that you want to? <laughs> There's a lot more man love going on oh, portraying yeah. the movie. Bad. Those yeah. Greeks. Um, <laughs> Tell me about the, that. the boy lovers. <laughs> uh, throw some serious shade at those guys too. Uh, okay, so let's do favorite moments. Um, my favorite moment in this movie is when the older father sees his son die on the battlefield. And the description that they give is like, and he went blood drunk. And he just goes ham on everybody and he's screaming and crying at the same time just killing tons of people that moment hits so hard for me besides the very very end where where leonidas is talking about his wife like that's like the ultimate like oh my god man it hits hard but uh, as far as favorite scenes um that one takes the cake for me and also the slow motion this is the second best use of slow motion in a movie for me personally uh, the first goes to dread the uh, carl urban Oh, comic book movie. Yeah. That's the best Another use. Another lead a heady movie. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. the best use of slow motion. This 300 is the second best use. Uh, you've obviously haven't watched many of John Woo's movies. <laughs> Don't even talk to me about that. <laughs> the freaking flying doves. <laughs> <laughs> Vader, what's your favorite moment in 300? Oh, man. There's a ton of good scenes in this. Um, just all the fight sequences when, when the, the Persians are storming the gates. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Anytime the screen goes black with arrows, <laughs> I always find that kind of cool. Yeah. You know, 
Um, Xerxes is so over the top. Every time he's on there, he just like takes over the movie. He's, he's pretty wild. I, I actually, the, the sequel to this movie, when they go into his backstory a little bit, I find kind of interesting, but we're not talking about that movie right now. <laughs> but um, I don't know, man. It's just favorite scene. I just like the whole movie. To be honest with the you, the whole movie is your favorite I, scene. I can't, I can't really pick a favorite. Do you have scene. a least favorite scene? Um, probably the boring stuff when they're just talking a lot. <laughs> when they're just talking, <laughs> you know, I don't know. <laughs> at the courthouse or or at the yeah. the council meeting or whatever. Yeah, the, this oh, movie yeah. moves. Yeah, it does. It really moves. It's it's a it's a good it's a good movie. I enjoy it. Right on. Yeah, Jude, you got a favorite moment? Um, I don't know, like. All of the fight scenes, I really liked how they like used their shield, and you got to see like why Spartans are so much more badass. And and I I even love like the beginning when they see where you see um, Leonidas from a boy to a man, like everything that he went through to make the king, mm -hmm. like and you really get a sense of yeah, the Spartans are um, they're on a whole different level as far as like humanity. Yeah, they're elite yeah. for sure. Kadis, you have a favorite moment? I do. Um, one of the interesting things about Zack Snyder movies is that there are, they are all collections of really awesome moments. And sometimes those moments add up to a good movie and other times they add up to a bad movie. Most of the time I would argue they add up to a bad movie. Um, but this movie has so many of those like singular moments that like visually just get burned into your brain. Um, entire movie's gorgeous. In fact, it was like the highest grossing R-rated movie ever up until Deadpool 2 came out. And uh, it was just like, uh, it was it was just like a very well-made film, a great translation of Frank Miller's work. And I think my favorite moment is when, you know, the, um, the Spartans kind of overtook the messenger from um, Xerxes. Uh, from Persia. From, from his army and uh they're kind of lording over him and he and he was like our arrows will blot out the sun and then you get michael fassbender's character and he's like then we will fight in the shade because that was that was an actual like historical quote like they actually said that and it was recorded by the historian who was like witnessing this stuff and it was it's just such a badass line <laughs> to, know, really to, to know that like you know uh, thousands of years ago uh, there was a guy who was that badass <laughs> and could respond in that way, you know, like, like uh, and, and to see it on screen, you, you just picture in your head, like, maybe it was just like that. Yeah. <laughs> be really cool. also, another really good line too, is like Spartans give up your shields and your spears. And then they, the one dude gets nailed with a spear and he goes, uh, Persians come and take them. And he's just holding it. I'm like, Oh, it's so bad. Yeah, and and th there's another great line that Gerard Butler delivers where he says like, you know, tonight we dine in hell. Mm. The actual line was tonight we dine in Hades because hell was a Viking um, underworld. Whereas uh, you know, Hades was Greek. Greek. Hades was Greek. Yeah. But there's also another line where uh, at the very end of the movie, when um, the, uh, the hunchback Ephelides, I can't Hades? say his name. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the hunchback uh, is kind of like, uh, he, he, ha he exchanges a last look with mm -hmm. Leonidas and, and he's kind of begging him to like bend the knee and, and join and not die. And Leonidas says to him, may you live forever. Mm. Yeah. And that's like the Hard. great, the, the greatest insult a Spartan warrior could um, deliver to someone else because the whole, the best way for a Spartan warrior to die is in battle. The warrior's death. Yeah. yeah. And if you live what does forever. He say, the beautiful death or glorious death or something. Yeah. If you live forever, then you're not truly a Spartan. That's right. So that, that was like a nice little moment. It's not something that's really pronounced. Like if you're not aware of like the mythology behind it, mm -hmm. you wouldn't pick up on that as, as an insult. But you're like, oh. Yeah. He's not mad. Yeah, he, for, he forgave him. Yeah. <laughs> no. It's like, yeah. you know, that's the exact opposite of what he just said. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, like, it's little things like that. Um, but I think out of all of the Frank Miller movies that have been made, this one is the, the top of the tier. Like, it's just, it's a gorgeous movie. It is a work of art. Uh, the story that it's based on, not only is it real, but it's also extremely well told and interesting. It's just a good movie. Yeah. Uh, all right, let's have we done ratings yet? I'm gonna give it oh. five out of five Spartan Shields for okay. me. Five out of five. Yeah, wow. it's another perfect movie, dude. I, I can't not love it. There's nothing about it that I don't like. What I'll, about you? I'll give it the highest rating I can and it not be perfect. <laughs> I'll give it four point nine nine stars. <laughs> right on. <laughs> Jude, how about you? Okay. So I do love this movie. However, 
Um, I loved it more when I first saw it because it blew me away. Whereas now I've seen it a couple of hundred times and it's, it's just not, it doesn't have the same wow effect for me. Okay. Um, I liked Sin City better. Oh, okay. Um, so for me, this is like my second favorite of what we've watched today. And because it produced so many obnoxious douchebags in bars, <laughs> and I used to work in a bar, so uh, it's, it's especially grating for me. I have to downgrade it to three and a half uh, hunchbacks. Good job, douchebags. You ruined the movie. <laughs> I should have worn my short shorts and cape. <laughs> <laughs> just a, just a, a spandex freaking onesie. Yeah. With Peter, red what are you cape? trying to do to my relationship? <laughs> oh my God, dang it out. <laughs> Uh, Kadesh, have you given a rating? Uh, I would give this movie a uh, four out of five. Lena Headey floppy boobs. <laughs> floppy? What? How dare How you? How dare you speak of her like that? I'm not yeah. saying. I mean, like in the movie, they were like bouncing. Because she was kidding. Don't say floppy. Yeah, yeah. floppy is a different term. negative Those connotation. Those are all natural. Say bouncy. Man. Those are amazing. <laughs> okay, four out of five natural. There you go. Boobs. The boob physics were spot on. <laughs> oh, yeah. Even with the Oracle, when she's like dancing underwater. Uh, she, yeah. looked little, she looked a little, uh, little, little. Stop. Just stop. Okay, guys. That's our review for 300. <laughs> okay. <laughs> boobs. <laughs> Highly recommend go checking this movie yeah. out. Why isn't it five stars if uh, it's got well, boobs it's, in it? Because <laughs> <laughs> nothing can compare to Raiders of the Lost Ark. There's only one five star movie. <laughs> that's ridiculous. Raiders of the Lost Ark. <laughs> that's a ridiculous standard. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I can't wait to talk about the next one. All right, guys, that's it for our discussion of 300. A uh, real quick word from our sponsors, and we'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody. Hey, real quick, if you'd like to support the podcast and get some awesome merch in return, go to saltynerdstore.com. There you can have access to all of our cool designs for our T-shirts, stickers, magnets, face masks, all kinds of cool stuff there. Uh, that's saltynerdstore.com. And we have a ton of cool designs, like I just said. And uh, we'd really appreciate you guys uh, rocking some of our merch uh, and as well uh, help support the podcast. Any money that goes into it helps us to uh, buy new equipment and create cool content for you to hang out and listen to. Give us money. Give us money. Give All right, guys. Money. For the podcast. For All right, guys. Before podcast. we get into the next movie, which is The Spirit, uh, the three of us are going to take a shot to get prepared for this one. Cheers to our listeners. Thank Cheers. you for listening. Cheers. Hang on tight. Uh, yeah. Gosh dang it, man. This is good stuff. Yeah. All right. This podcast brought to you by alcohol. This podcast, yeah. If you would like to support our drinking habit, go to saltynerdclub.com. Become a patron. Look, there you can see all of our bloopers. Man. Did you pause that whole thing dude, off? This, this bottle's gone. It took like a, about a month. <laughs> Four podcasts, I think it took to, to nail this sucker. Every down. time you guys do a shot, it's like somebody electrocuted you. You guys are all like, Ooh. I know, it's like, because I'm not, I've never been a Miss, Miss Bartender over there. You yeah, guys are weak. She's Jude, the only one who can hold her liquor at this table. I'm a seasoned drinker. I, uh, I was always beer and tequila before I met you guys. I didn't, I never drank this much. <laughs> and if I drink bourbon or whiskey, it was with Coke. Okay. I, now I'm just pulling shit. Cocaine? Yeah, but like, I love Coke. Coke. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's talk about the spirit. Jude, tell Boy us, what is this they. nonsense all about? All right, 2008, The Spirit, rated PG-13 with a runtime of one hour, 43 minutes. Had a budget of $60 million. What do you think it brought into the box? <laughs> $60 million, uh, I'm going to say it brought in 85 Vader? Um, 30 39 million. Whoa, yeah. it underperformed? Oh, yeah. Wow. It was a bomb. Word must yeah. have been real bad on this one, though. Dude, this movie is dog shit. Yeah, it kind of right? is. It really is. It kind of is. I have a theory about this, though. This is Let the me only... walk you through it first before okay, you sorry. get into yep. your theory. Go ahead, All right. go ahead. The spirit beats up bad guys and sometimes vice versa. His nemesis, the octopus, injected him with superpower juice that caused him to awaken again after his death. Now, octopus wants to become immortal, and the spirit is the only one with the power to stop him. Meanwhile, all the ladies love cool spirit. His childhood sweetheart is back in town. Lady Death wants that spirit stick, and Dr. Goodlove <laughs> keeps patching him up in between smooches. Spirit, who used to be a cop, begins to unravel the mystery of his superpowers while fighting crime and stopping Octopus from getting his hands on the one thing he needs to become unstoppable. My synopsis is better than this movie. Yeah, it kind it of is. sounds better. Yeah. It on paper. Wouldn't you, it makes wouldn't more you sense. go see this movie just based on my synopsis? Yes. Don't. <laughs> um, okay, so my theory. We've talked about Frank Miller movies, Sin City, work of art, classic, directed by Robert Rodriguez. 300, classic, work of art, 
directed by Zack Snyder. Zack Snyder. Who directed this? Frank, Frank Miller. Miller. <gasps> oh, oh, Angel. Yeah. So this is what I think happened. It was and this, this was he crazy. He was in this too, right? He was in yeah. this. He was also in Sin City. A, he does a cameo in almost everything oh. he's in. He, he wasn't he in 300. He wasn't in 300? No. Okay. He was in... <laughs> he wasn't a Spartan. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought maybe he would be like one of the council members or something. Um, I think, and Kadish can correct me if I'm wrong on this theory, if he knows, but I think all this buzz around Frank Miller movies being like the hot new shit, you know, like 300, Sin City, all that stuff, I think it all went to his head and he's like, I'm going to direct my movie. And this is basically him directly adapting one of his comic books um and he just he, his fame and his uh his newly found uh you he, know he tell me why he 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 just went over the top he went way too far and thought he was hot shit and didn't think he could make a mistake and unfortunately he didn't have a, anybody to check him on it so this movie is basically just his ego on film okay it, what say you is, is that theory? correct or incorrect slightly incorrect um so basically uh they had been trying to make the spirit since the 70s and uh, in fact originally uh, william friedkin had wanted to do an adaptation of the spirit because it was a comic book strip in the newspapers by will eisner um way back in the day and people had loved this comic book character for a long time and uh harlan ellison had can't come on to write the screenplay for um the spirit and if you don't know who harlan ellison is like he, he's kind of like a famous science fiction guy wrote a couple of st like really well-known star trek episodes and stuff like that I, I got to meet him occasionally at the star trek conventions before he passed away and he was known for being a real jerk and him and william Friedkin got into an argument one night on something completely unrelated and it destroyed their working relationship and that was the end of the spirit adaptation so flash forward to about 2004 and Odd Lot Entertainment acquires the rights to the spirit. And um, Will Eisner, unfortunately, passed away in 2005. And at the funeral for Will Eisner, um, Frank Miller was approached by the Odd Lot Entertainment guys. And they're like, hey, you know, we've been trying to get Will's, you know, comic book. If there's one place to wheel and deal, it's at a funeral. So, so basically, um, at first... Um, Frank Miller says like, no, like I'm, I'm not up for that challenge. But then he realized it's like, you know, if anyone else does this, they're probably going to mess it up. And so he was like, you know what, on second thought, I'll, I'll try to do Will justice. And so this wasn't a Frank Miller comic book. This was his interpretation of Will Eisner's comic. Mm. And the original spirit was just like uh, a regular guy in a mask. He didn't have any superpowers. It was like Batman. Y yeah, sort of. How dare you but he also had, he, he also had like the the sidekick who was a very racist stereotype of a, a black kid and um so like they left that out of the adaptation but um good call yeah yeah <laughs> but a, a lot of the the adjustments that were made like giving him like supernatural powers and and adding the superhero aspect to it that was all done for the movie so he didn't come back from the dead in the comic no well i mean like he was left for dead but then like he came back and uh his old self was considered dead and okay. you know he assumed the identity of the spirit and he didn't have a, the power over the ladies <laughs> <laughs> that's a frank miller thing <laughs> right? like frank miller has these themes that he likes to explore and a lot of them i think for this movie it was mostly like he just wanted to work with all these hot girls and so like he came up with you know characters from the comics that he could pull into the movie so that he could cast Scarlett Johansson and, and like he, he vicariously lived through the spirit yeah something yeah. like that yeah, like like even that's Men magic <laughs> <laughs> Eva Mendes had wanted to work with Frank Miller um cuz you know she's from the Robert Rodriguez kind of yeah. stable there and so she signed on before anyone else to do this movie and uh, they cast her as San Sher Serif. I mean, she's gorgeous in this movie. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. She's beautiful. She's the best part about this For movie. For me, she's the poor man's Rosario Dawson. <gasps> oh, no. I'm sorry. No way. Rosario Dawson is my number one side chick. <laughs> <laughs> Eva Mendez can touch it, but not side But, but th <laughs> this, this was Frank Miller's first movie directing solo, like with Sin City. Like I said, he wasn't really a director on that. Like it was Robert Rodriguez translating his comic book on the screen. Mm -hmm. So like he was on set and he was mm -hmm. watching stuff and he, and he had a say in how the movie was made, but he wasn't actually a director. Uh, same thing with 300. He was more of a consultant mm -hmm. than he was anything else because that was 
all of Zack Snyder's movie. This was his first foray into being a solo director. And um, I think that that the disappointment of this movie kind of killed that directing career of his. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because I so. this movie, uh, I, I can remember when it was coming out, they didn't know how to market this film. It, it was, you know, it was it had no connection to Sin City other than the the style, the style. and and the guy making it. And I, I feel like the his script for this movie just wasn't very good. I had never even heard of this movie until we said that we were going to watch it for the podcast this week. I, I've I had heard of it, but I never watched it. I think mostly because I heard all the bad buzz about it, and I was like, I don't need to. Yeah, yeah this like, is, this is the first time viewing for me as well. Yeah, like something happened to Frank Miller in the '90s that completely destroyed his ability to tell like a good story <laughs> and, and probably like coke heroin or something. <laughs> well i don't know what it was <laughs> uh, it, it, it might just be with old age but everything that he's done since uh the dark knight returns has kind of been or no. since since the end of sin city has has kind of been bad like you know like I, i've read some of his his newer stuff and it just doesn't hold a candle to when he was in his prime and i think this movie is it kind of uh, an extension of that where he wrote a screenplay that just wasn't very good and the, the characters weren't interesting like well, and th- and th- this just didn't have his sensibility like he tried to inject some of his sensibility into this but this wasn't this wasn't a Frank Miller comic this was mm. something completely different right. from a different age mm-hmm. I so, think sometimes you you know you s- start off from the bottom and you're writing all of these stories about like the things that you fantasize about, like being really cool or being really powerful or being really rich or having all of these women falling at your feet. And, you know, then you get to a certain place in your career where you get all of that and then you have nothing to fantasize about and your stories that you're writing about the things that you want to do or want to be just, they fall flat, fall, bleh, fall flat. Mm. Interesting. Vader, you were going to say something? I yeah, I don't know. Nothing about this movie makes any sense to me. It's just it's well, just it's just weird and dumb from the It's get-go. weird and dumb and boring, yeah. I was going to yeah, ask. The, the main villain is called the Octopus. Yeah. For God's sakes. And, and you know, and and Sam Jackson can't even make it good. Yeah. And he and he tries. You know it's but, a bad movie when but, Sam Jackson can't make it better. Yeah. It's and and you know, it's just and it as this thing goes along, it just makes less and less sense. You know, you know, there's there's actors in here that I like. That just they've just phoned this thing home. It's just none of it makes any sense. It's like the costume, the octopus. What what's it up with his wardrobe? Did, did you notice we the did, wardrobe? Well, yeah, he they, did like they, this. they wanted to give him a different costume in every scene. Yeah, was, they did like the samurai ins- thing, the and same. then they went the the full Nazi Why? uniform. It made zero sense. It was the most the the worst translation of a comic book I could ever think of. Because this is very much like bombastic comic book stuff. It was well, it didn't translate. It does not translate. It's like All we go I was from missing was like the pow, yeah, and the bam, it, yeah. It, I mean, that, it felt that like '66 Batman. You know what I mean? Like this, Adam West it, Batman. It's style. kind of funny because yeah. Louis Lombardi he plays like the clones in this movie. Oh, like, they're like, dumb. The they're just, they don't make any sense. And every time I see him, I just see him as the teamster from And God Spoke. <laughs> 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 I'm, just, I'm always like, it's it's that guy. Hey, yo, like, <laughs> get off my truck. Like the dumb, like the the. The trope of a dumb sidekick, some dumb sidekick, like they took it over the top in this, and it, the, those characters were just insufferable. They put his face on a foot. Insufferable is a great yeah. word for this movie. Insufferable. It's there's, just there's a foot clone. Yeah, it's the dumbest thing. It's I've the ever dumbest seen. thing ever. I it's mean, so, Tarantino would be and, super and, into that. And we, <laughs> and we get and we get five minutes of Sam Jackson going. This thing's really fucking weird, and, and it, but he doesn't say that because it's PG thirteen. Yeah, right. It, and it's just like. It's just weird, and you know the Nazi thing, they, like Sam Jackson in a freaking Nazi, Nazi outfit, and then ScarJo comes out in her Nazi outfit, and you could just kind of tell that they probably weren't she, very comfortable doing she that. Didn't really know what she was getting herself into <laughs> when she signed up for this thing. Yeah, and she looks very pretty though. She She's gorgeous. Just looked, she just she looked like she was in pain. You, you know the fa- right, the failure just, of this movie back to back with a dame to kill for the failure of that movie kind of ended the uh frank miller craze and that was going on in hollywood i'm kind of glad it did wait those came out the same year a dame uh, to kill for no like i think it came out either before or after this movie um but like just the the, the back to back failure of of these two frank miller films i think affected it one after another i'm I'm gonna skip around because i just don't care (laughs) about about this movie and because it's just okay a dame to kill for didn't come out until 14. Okay. Hmm. All right. 
Continue. What were you going to um, say? Nothing in this movie made sense. How so? It, it was Can you just, be more specific? It was that? just more random scenes after random scenes. It's like we go from. It, it's hard because, you know, it's just like stuff was just thrown at us for no reason. It's like what the belly dancer. Oh, look, we got this random belly dancer chick. What was the point of the belly dancer? Pla- pla- plaster of Paris. Yeah, it's just it's just. <sighs> I think it was it was a lack of focus. They they well, tried to throw well, too much at at too. The, the, the biggest issue with this movie is you just you can't invest in any of the characters because you just don't care don't about care. any mm-hmm. of the characters, and you never understand what um, the spirit's actual power is, and th- there's never really any. Like you don't care about his rivalry with the octopus. Yeah, the, 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 this movie is just a whole bunch of not caring strung together. <laughs> is, it, is his you know? special power that he's like, if he talks to a woman, they fall in love with him? Oh, mm-hmm. that's a very like 1930s like noir thing, right? Where like everybody has the hots for the detective. I, I feel like it was a little more than that. I, I think every everybody just has the hots, but I think when I say lack of focus, I'm like there's aspects to this movie that I really like. Like her, the little love triangle with the spirit, with his old girlfriend who left to go, you know, be rich and famous versus the doctor who actually cares for him. Like, I thought there was something there that they could have explored. They didn't and build also on any of it. every other woman in between that he saves. <laughs> Ooh, I'm in a comic book and yeah. you just walked into a room. I want to beg. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a bit over the top. Mm-hmm. Like, Cause you were mentioning like in the other movies in, in 300 and in Sin City, like the women, yes, they were hot as hell. Mm-hmm. Yes. They were into the men in the movie, but they were also very much their own character. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They could, and they, they had could take, strength. Yeah. There was strength to, to those characters. The, the in this, there was just like hot chicks vomited onto a screen that yeah. wanted to like S a D. The, the the marketing for this movie was all based around the women that were in it. Like mm-hmm. all the posters, like you, you, they didn't even feature Gabriel Mack who plays the uh, the spirit. It was all <laughs> close ups of like Scarlett Johansson, you know, um, Eva Long, Eva. Uh, no, no, uh, it was uh, Eva Mendes. Eva, Eva Mendes. Sorry, yeah, yeah, Eva Mendes. Um, it was um. Stanya Kadic and uh, what, what's her name? The, the girl from uh, Sarah Paulson. Sarah Paulson, thank you. So, like, all the posters were about them, and they were trying to sell it on. Well, they had watched the movie and they knew that they didn't have <laughs> anything very good. And they were like, "What do we have? We have hot um, women. Put uh, them on the poster and send it to the world. The, send it to the internet." <laughs> and we have the dad from the Wonder Years. So, yes. Yeah. 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 Um, As the detective, <laughs> like I'm, I, I like the like the noir detective style that they go for. And like I said, if they kind of focus this movie down a little bit more and left out some of the more cheesy aspects, like within the first twenty minutes of this movie, you have the main antagonist and the main protagonist go out like an all drag out battle, and it means nothing because you, you have no care. yeah you don't it's, it's you like, have no idea who they are. Most comic book movies, I can forgive the absurdity of the weirdness. Mm-hmm. But there was just something about this movie that from the get-go, I did not like. There's a and line. I did, and I didn't go into this movie. I knew nothing about this movie going yeah. into it. Same. So I had a blank slate. I had no expectations. And within 15 minutes, I was like, this is stupid. There was like cartoon noises. At one point in time, yeah. Samuel Jackson says, toilet bowls are always funny. It was you, just like. I didn't I didn't even like the, the opening battle between an octopus. <laughs> fucking worst name ever. For mm-hmm. And. and um, and and the spirit when they're just like beating the shit out of each other yeah. and it's like okay we get it they they can't hurt each other yeah really. I, I think in the comics you know, it, uh the octopus you only ever saw his hands um like you never saw like it was kind of like a dr claw type yeah. thing mm-hmm. um but they changed a lot for this movie i will say that the visuals of this movie are probably the best part of it um they they really they don't go for the full sin city black and white it's extremely desaturated almost to the point of being in black and white but there's just enough color where it's kind of interesting but i felt the colors were just random they didn't they didn't make any yeah, sense with sin as city. to what was colored with sin city they were nuanced and there was yes. like the reds popped yeah you know or there was a or reason the yellow from the yellow there bastard. was a reason for the color this movie there was no reason for any of the yeah colors. It, it felt like they were kind of doing a hybrid between sin city and 300 because yeah. with and 300 it, they had this process called crushing uh-huh. which, which basically like dropped the colors and accentuated the blacks and sin city or 300 was in color um, but it was so like um, it was very muted. desaturated yeah. that like it almost felt like monochrome almost, and it worked. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah so this, uh, 
Sorry. This, this movie, it didn't work. This was just like Frank Miller going, oh, I want to do that that color trick that we've done on the other movies. Well, I think it just and speaks it to just his, inex- <laughs> his inexperience as a director. He didn't he didn't have a, a solid vision in mind. He just kind of went with what was popular at the time, maybe, and he didn't know how to use the tools that he had. Go ahead, Jude. You were going to say something? Uh, well, so originally we were going to watch uh, 300, Sin City, and Kick-Ass because Kick we were going to do like underrated like comic book movies or something. Mm-hmm. And... Um, I think that this is another example of Kadish bamboozling all of us because no one had watched Kick-Ass yet except for me because I fucking watched it. But um, no one had watched it except for me yet. I mean, we, we've and all seen it. So <laughs> Kadish was like, you know what we should do? We should do a Frank Miller yeah. week and then we should watch The Spirit instead. And I don't think any of us knew what we were going to be watching. I don't know if you had ever seen it before, I Alex. I, I had never even heard of it before. And yeah. then when he said, oh, it's a Frank Miller and it's done like in the style of Sin City. And I was actually excited to you, watch it. You know what we did, right? We forgot that Kadish was banned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. So when it first started, I was like, like I saw like, um, I, fucking hate you, this, this, I saw the style of it and I was like excited and I was like, oh shit, this is going to be so good. I can't yeah. believe I've never seen this before. I can't believe I've never even heard of this before. And like 10 minutes in, I was like, you son of a bitch. <laughs> oh and, like, no. Like, she, she literally looked at me and she's like, is this movie terrible? <laughs> and I, I, I was like, I was like, yeah. I was like, am I taking crazy pills or is this garbage? <laughs> no, no, why? Garbage. <laughs> and I, w- I was, I was really like, I was pissed because yeah. I was like, why would you do this to us? Well, just, just to let you know, this isn't the last comic book week we're ever going to do. Good. And, and uh, you know, next time we're, we'll do uh yeah. kick ass. Can kick we ass do it while Kanish is out of fucking town or something? <laughs> yeah. Does it ruin it? <laughs> For sure. I love you. Well, well, you know what we but should do. But also, I hate you. You know what? Let's get let's get uh, Tom to come in full time. Yes. Oh, and <laughs> we'll just put Kadish on the end of the table with the equipment, and he can be full time producer. Boom. I'm, I'm fine with that. There we go. <laughs> Don't have to deal with you guys. <laughs> But you still get no. the joy of editing. I will. And we can, yeah. go, and we can go and Kadish is down there too, guys. Yeah. yeah. He can <laughs> be, no, hey, we'll just have him. We'll it. have him do the synopsis. And he'll be like, well, the story behind this will be like, shut up, Kadish. <laughs> is Kadish going to be our new Jamie? <laughs> yeah, he's Jamie. <laughs> okay. Band. <laughs> he'll be like Johnny from uh, Big Lebowski. He'll be like, God <laughs> damn it, Johnny. Up, Johnny. You're out of your element. <laughs> He's, no, we're giving so, him a we're giving him a compliment. I know, it's, yeah, it's not yeah. my fault that Frank Miller made a bad movie. <laughs> no. Okay, and, and I will, I'm having fun trashing on him, but yeah. in Kaish's defense, I do think it was a good idea to do Frank Miller. Oh, for week. sure. Yes, because yeah. we can see the top tier Frank Miller versus when he went crazy. He went crazy, and yeah. we have like full like George Lucas prequels. You know, no nobody to check him on any of his nonsense. Yeah. We had already watched everything for the week when we we decided <laughs> to watch this one. This ruined my week. <laughs> this so this oh they're here. Yeah, yeah. they're here. Do you so, guys want to do final thoughts? Yeah. yeah. Okay, let's really do final quick. thoughts on okay, the spirit. Uh, are we all good? Like thumbs down on everything. One, this two, is three. a yeah. Ready? One, two, three. <laughs> This is a terrible yeah. movie. Um, there's only one thing I like about it, and that's the artistic style of the, See, the comic book. I didn't think they even did that very it's well. It's not as good as the other ones, but it's still charming in, in a way. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, like, there's, a, there's a gardener that comes at the same time on every podcast. We usually cut around it, but we're in a hurry now, so and we're going to just... We just want to get this over with. We're just going to blaze through it, guys, so we, bear with us. And it's the spirit, so we don't care. Yeah, yeah. We don't care about this movie. <laughs> okay, Vader, uh, final thoughts. Final thoughts, Vader. One star... One star butthole fest. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a one star butthole. It's awful. Okay. Jude? Yeah, this was terrible. It ruined my week. I hate it. I will never watch it again. And I give it a, a one star crap fest okay. rating. Just Kadish? like the lawnmower outside. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, one one star. <laughs> one star crap fest. Yeah, same for me. One star crap fest. Very few things I like about this movie. All right, guys, that's it for our podcast. Please forgive the gardeners. They have a job to do just like us. Go to saltynerdstore.com, pick up some merch, or go to saltynerdclub.com. The gardeners get paid, unlike us. So send us money. <laughs> All right, signing off. Perfect ending to this show. Right? <laughs> Hold on, I can't. I can't. The quality. It's a, it's a one star lawnmower fest. <laughs> oh my God. Okay, I'm so sorry, guys, listeners. I really do apologize. Uh, Vader, where can they find you on the socials? At MattVader74 on the um, Twitter, Instagram, and um, the YouTubes. All right, Jude. 
You can find me at the business end of a lawnmower <laughs> uh, at I am Choo 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 on Instagram, Twitter, and um, TikTok. That's a visual. Matthew Kadish. <laughs> At Matthew Kadish, K-A-D-I-S-H on Twitter and KadishBooks.com if you want to check me out on the Amazon. And I am your host, Salty Nerd. You can catch me on Twitter at Salty underscore Nerd. And as always, stay salty, my friends. <laughs> 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 <laughs>